Frank Rosenblatt, an American psychologist, first invented perceptrons around 1957. This term, perceptron, was meant to describe many different theoretical nerve nets. He insisted they were not tools for artificial intelligence or pattern recognition, but rather simplified brain models that represented natural intelligence. Perceptrons were, in his words, designed to illustrate some of the fundamental properties of intelligent systems in general. This video will attempt to explain how a simple, single-layer perceptron works. But first, let's look at what it represents. It's our understanding that real neurons in our brains work by receiving electrochemical pulses called neurotransmitters from the dendrites and synapses of other neurons. There are dozens of types of neurotransmitters, but they can be categorized into two groups, excitatory, which you can think of as positive, and inhibitory, which you can think of as negative. The neuron will fire if the algebraically combined voltage of the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters are greater than a certain threshold. The strength of the connection between each synapse to the neuron determines how strong the received pulse is. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Or in other words, the more often neurons fire in sequence, the stronger the connection between them becomes. Theoretically, this changing of connection strength between neurons is what allows us to learn. And to get even more theoretical, when you put billions of neurons together in a network, the firing patterns create higher level structures, which result in things like consciousness and memory. The perceptron is our attempt at replicating this behavior with machines. We simulate a neuron by inputting numbers, which correspond to the neurotransmitters sent from other neurons, multiplying those numbers by weights, which correspond to the strength of the connection between the synapse to the neuron, summing the numbers up and outputting zero if the sum is negative or one if the sum is positive, corresponding to a neuron not firing, zero, or firing, one. The values in the weights are then changed during training depending on what we want the perceptron to be used for, which corresponds to strengthening or weakening the synapses between neurons. And this allows the perceptron to learn. A neural network simulates how our brain works by combining many perceptrons, which form unique firing patterns that can do things like read handwriting, recognize faces from video footage, or drive cars by themselves. Sadly, we haven't been able to create consciousness just yet, so the perceptron can be thought of as the basic building block of neural networks, at least for a type of neural network called an MLP, a multi-layer perceptron. Also, it's important to note, in neural networks, the output from one perceptron to another is not simply zero or one. Different activation functions output different values, but for a single perceptron, there's no need for anything but a zero or one, because that's the final output. The big picture is simple enough to understand, but for those without a mathematical background, why and what all these numbers are doing is probably a complete mystery. How does this work in practice? Why do we multiply inputs by weights and take the sum? How do we change the weights? Let's take a closer look to understand. A single perceptron by itself is performing binary classification, or separating data into two groups, input that fires and input that doesn't fire. Here's a real-world example of how this is useful. If you were walking in a field of flowers and picked one up randomly, how would you figure out what type of flower it is? You would look at all the attributes the flower possesses, things like the color, the length of the petals, the width of the petals, and the number of petals, and so on. And you would compare these to entries in a database that has previously recorded attributes of different flower types and make a best guess as to which flower type has the closest measurements. A trained perceptron will automatically tell you which flower type it is if you give it the attributes you just measured, saving time and increasing the chance of correctly classifying the flower. A single perceptron is, however, limited to differentiating between only two types of flowers, so you would first have to narrow the possible flower types down to two. But a large enough neural network could classify any flower, if given the right measurements, and it's all being done by a bunch of perceptrons working together.
Let's continue the flower example with a real set of flower measurements from the popular iris data set that's commonly used in college statistics classes. A link to the data set is in the description. This data set contains three classes in which each class is a specific type of iris flower, each with four attributes, the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, and the petal width measured in centimeters, and 50 instances of each class an instance being one set of measurements. Since the perceptron is limited to binary classification, we will ignore the third iris type and use the first two, iris setosa and iris versicolor for this example. Let's look at an overview of the perceptron again and walk through how to set it up and how it works with this example. Every perceptron has a set of weights. Weights are just a set of numbers, but these numbers are used to store information and they tell the perceptron how to classify data. There should be the same number of weights as input attributes. Since the iris dataset has four attributes, we will have four weights. When creating a new untrained perceptron, it's recommended to set the initial value of the weights to a small random number. So let's choose 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0.15, and negative 0.2. Why start at small random numbers instead of 0? Because if all the weights started at 0, regardless of what the input is, the output would always be 0. Anything times 0 is 0. This means training won't happen if the data is labeled as class 1, the positive class, because we count 0 as positive. However, if the training data order is sufficiently randomized, this isn't that big of a deal for the perceptron, as it only results in at most a few lost data instances of training in the first epoch, until it sees a negative class and those values are added to the weights. We will label Iris Setosa as class 0, and Iris Versicolor as class 1, by adding these values to the end of the input vector. Next, we will take one instance of Iris Setosa and input the data. Every input corresponds to an attribute of data, so attribute 1, the sepal length, will always be input 1, and weight 1, currently 0 0.1, will always be multiplied by input 1. The first instance for iris setosa is 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, 0.2, .1, and the class label as 0, which will just be stored for now as this is only used during training. After each input is multiplied by a weight, all of those values are then added together. Since this value is positive, the perceptron fires, which means it labeled the data as 1. The perceptron checks this against the answer you provided, 0. Since it found the incorrect answer, the perceptron undergoes training to change its weights, so it outputs the correct answer of 0. Changing the weights is done by adding to each weight the input multiplied by the error. We find the error, which is the expected value minus the calculated value. We expected 0, because that's what we labeled the data as, but the perceptron calculated 1. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. We multiply each input by negative 1, making them all negative, then add that to the respective weights. Now, if we input the same instance again, as shown here, it returns 0, as expected. Next, we take one instance of iris versicolor and input the data. Perceptron was wrong again, so it changes the weights. There are only three possible error values, 0, 1, or negative 1. If it's 0, the perceptron is correct, so no changes happen to the weights. If the error is 1, the input is added to the weights, and if the error is negative 1, the input is subtracted from the weights. This process continues until we have gone through every instance of data, which is the first epoch. Then we shuffle the data and once again, go through every instance of data, repeating until the perceptron answers correctly for every instance. It should be noted that shuffling, or randomizing the order of the data, can speed up the training process and avoid running into situations where the training never finishes, because the same values are being added or subtracted to the weights. This is particularly the case when the data is ordered by class. Avoid doing this. The perceptron is then fully trained, and you can now pick new iris setosa and iris versicolor flowers, measure them, input the data to the perceptron, and it will tell you which flower you picked. Also worth noting, the final values of the weights after a perceptron is trained 
can and will be different every time, depending on how you initially randomize the weights and shuffle the data. All right, great. That's how a perceptron classifies and trains. But this wasn't enough for me to fully understand. How does this work? How does multiplying input by weights and adding them classify data? The process of multiplying two sets of numbers together, then adding them, is called the dot product. There are two ways to define the dot product. Algebraically, as we've already seen, by multiplying the two vectors, then adding those values together. And this makes sense in that we are controlling the value of the a's, the input, by changing the values of the b's, the weights. But it still doesn't really make sense how this is splitting various inputs into two groups. It wasn't until I took a look at the geometric definition that I understood. Geometrically, all we really need to do is look at the cosine of theta, as magnitudes a and b are just lengths, and are only really useful during training, because the magnitudes a and b are always positive. So the dot product will be positive if the cosine of theta is positive, or negative if the cosine of theta is negative. Let's look at a visual representation of 2D vectors for simplicity. If we have a data input with attributes 2.5 and 1.5, we can plot this point on a 2D graph and create a vector from it. Now let's draw the weights with values 0.5 and 2. The cosine of theta, with theta being the angle between the two vectors, can tell us if the vectors are pointing in the same direction or away from each other. We humans can see this clearly simply by seeing if the angle between them is greater than 90 degrees or not. If the angle is less than 90 degrees, the dot product will be positive. If it's greater than 90 degrees, it'll be negative. Why does the cosine of theta being positive or negative matter? The weight vector is essentially splitting the plane into two parts with a line perpendicular to itself. This is how it separates the two data sets. You can also think of it as the weight vector being the slope in a formula for a line that separates the two data sets. The line formula is y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, which if you remember from math classes, slope is rise over run. Here the x-axis represents weight 1, and the y-axis represents weight 2. So we have weight 2 over weight 1. But because the actual line we are trying to calculate is perpendicular to the weight vector, we use the opposite reciprocal slope, negative weight 1 over weight 2. To make it easier to understand, let's walk through an example. Let's plot three data points from one class and three data points from a second class. We designate one half of the space divided by our line for the red class, and the other half for the blue class. The goal is to change the values of the weight vector so that the slope of the line it represents separates the red class data points into the red area and the blue class data points into the blue area. This is what happens when training a perceptron. And once it's trained, we can plot any new data point and easily see if it's in the blue or red areas, class 0 or 1. This same concept works for any number of attributes. For data with two attributes, a plane is being divided into two parts with a line, as seen here. For data with three attributes, a 3D space is being divided into two parts with a plane. For data with four attributes, a 4D space is being divided into two parts with a 3D space, though we humans can't visualize this. This space the attributes are plotted in is called the feature space, which has the same dimensions as the number of attributes. The space that divides it is called the hyperplane, which is a subspace that is one dimension less than the space it inhabits. Okay, there's one last thing we need to cover. Most neural networks add what's called a bias. This is useful in an individual perceptron too. A bias is an extra input and weight. The input is a static value of one that never changes. The weight of the bias gets trained like the other weights by adding or subtracting 1. However, it's not part of the dot product in the integration function. It's not doing anything to the input or weight vectors directly. If we send an input into the perceptron, the integration function works just like before. We take the dot product of the input and the weights while ignoring the bias. Only now, after we find the dot product 
we add the value of the bias to it. If we take a closer look, we can see this is essentially an efficient way of training the threshold value in the activation function. Remember before we said if the value is zero or higher, it returns the positive class. If it's less than zero, it returns the negative class. Now, instead of using zero as the threshold, we use the negative of the bias. If the bias weight is 1.3, the activation function becomes if x is greater than or equal to negative 1.3, return 1. Else, if it's less than negative 1.3, return 0. If we didn't add the bias to the dot product. Adding the bias of 1.3 to the dot product does the same thing without us having to change the actual threshold value in the code. Why is a bias useful? In practice, shifting the threshold allows the perceptron to find and separate groups of smaller values from larger values. For example, if you had these three instances for class 1, and these three instances for class 2, the points themselves can be separated by a straight line, but that line can't go through the origin. So without a bias, the perceptron will never be able to solve the problem. Now, if we add a bias, the line can be shifted so it correctly separates them. You can think of the bias as the equivalent to the y-intercept, or b, in the equation for a line. Although it's not really the equivalent, the bias value does not directly correlate to the y-intercept because the amount needed to shift the threshold is dependent on the magnitude of the weight vector. For example, if we take the dot product of this small green weight vector and this red input vector, we get a value of 0.26. And if we take the dot product of the weight vector and this blue input vector, we get 0.72. A bias value of, say, negative 0.4 would be valid, and the perceptron would classify correctly, even though if we draw the line with the y-intercept of 0.4, it clearly doesn't separate them. And remember, it's the negative of the bias used as a threshold because it's added to the dot product before comparing it to 0. Adding negative 0.4 to 0.26 will turn it negative, while adding negative 0.4 to 0.72 will remain positive. This is how a bias separates data points. So for these two input vectors, any value between negative 0.27 and negative 0.72 would work for the bias. It's not exactly the same as the y-intercept, but it does perform the same function. There is also one really big limitation of a perceptron. It can only correctly classify data that's linearly separable. For example, if the data looked something like this, a single line can't separate the data into two parts. Neural networks solve this by allowing the line to bend and turn, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Hopefully this has helped you understand how a perceptron works in theory. If you would like to see one in practice, I have a video where I build a perceptron from scratch in C++ and train the iris data talked about in this video. If you have any questions or notice a mistake, feel free to comment and I will do my best to answer.